So this paper is built around two stories from London in the 1980s. One about a child care center in Wandsworth, and the other about a housing estate in Tower Hamlets. In October 1982, the Greater London Council's Women's Committee approved a grant of 11,000 pounds to the Hillside Common Ownership Day Nursery in Ballon, Wandsworth. The nursery, uh, sorry, it had asked for funds to acquire new premises and to employ extra staff. The nursery hoped to relieve what it called the burden of constant childcare on non-working mothers, and as well to increase, and I quote again, employment opportunities for women with young children. A huge part of the work of DLC committees like the Women's Committee was to administer grants to local groups. In the case of the Women's Committee, often as not, this meant giving money to child care centers. In 1984, 60% of the Women's Committee grant budget was spent on funding independent child care centers. And by the time the GLC was abolished in 1986, 12% of all full-time child care places in London were financed by GLC grants. The second story concerns the Lincoln Estate in Tower Hamlets, about which, in 1984, the GLC's Ethnic Minorities Committee heard evidence of racial harassment against 25 families of Bangladeshi origin, and it's a long quote that I'm about to, to use. Nearly all the Bangladeshi tenants had experienced some form of attack on their person or property, ranging from attacks on children, the spitting, jostling, name-calling, to lighted fireworks, lighted matches being put through the letterbox. Two tenants have been fired at by air guns. The Bangladeshis claimed that racial harassment has become an integral part of their everyday life on the estate. Women live like prisoners. They do not dare to go out. Children are often not allowed to play outdoors unless in very large groups outside the flats because of the risk of abuse and attacks. Bangladeshi men often do their shopping in groups and come back in a taxi. And that's the end of the quote. The point of the harassment, harassment that was perpetrated by youths, adult men, and women, was to, and I quote, drive the Bangladeshis off the estate, unquote. A few me members, excuse me, of the local tenants association, for example, and I quote again, voiced strong opposition to Asian families being there in the first place. Some even stated, and I quote, if they saw incidents of harassment, they would certainly do nothing to stop it. In its working paper of last year, the, the MBS uh, encouraged us to reflect on what it called the cultures of democracy in modern Britain, noting uh, the diverse and hierarchical patterns of democratic participation and what are called the multiple sets of values, the sense of being value that shaped everyday life. Um, so having been so encouraged and having duly reflected today, what I want to do is think about how these two stories that I've told uh, speak to these questions in different ways. I'm particularly interested in, in two things. First of all, how cultures of democracy are inflected by space, emotion, and the body. And second, how we might explore the politics of everyday life. And by that, I mean how power, agency, and ideology might gather around the experience, experiences, rhythms, and demands of everyday life, like dwelling, moving about, working, and parenting. Now, I also should begin with an apology. Um, when I thought of a title for this talk, and it's a title which I really, really wish I could dearly change to what's so funny about peace, love, and understanding, in one of those kind of sad moments when you, you suddenly have a clever repost of something that was sent to you 12 years ago. <laughs> so that's the academic version of it. Anyway, when I thought of a title for this talk, I, I flew, however ponderously, rather too close to the sun. And I thought I would talk about the body. I'm not going to talk about the body. I'm, I'm going to talk about space and emotions. That being said, the, the stories that I've told are about the body. The racial discrimination faced by Bangladeshi tenants on the Lincoln Estate included attacks on the person, as well as threats of physical violence. Funding the nursing in Ballum was intended to relieve the burden of constant childcare, a burden that is, of course, physical as much as figurative. It's worth recounting how one Lewisham mother, a worker in a local co-op, characterized her typical day in 1984, and I quote, I have to get up early 
get the kids ready, take them to school, come here, go home, do my work there, pick the kids up from school and make their dinner. When I get home from catering, I'm so tired, I can hardly keep my eyes open. So even though I will do, do it no justice in this paper, the, the body does, I think, figure in my, my thinking about cultures of democracy on the ground. I will talk more about space, and by this I mean actual material space, the physical and built environment. But of course, I also use the term to indicate contestation or struggle, the, the struggle for, for space and the meaning of space. In the stories that I have told, the acquisition of material property was central to the aims of one group. It was central to the aims of, of the nursery. While on the Lincoln estate, space was the point of contestation between tenants and the catalyst for deeply held fears and animosity on both sides. Space was also fundamental to what the Labour GLC did in the 1980s. Much of the funding that's given out by local groups, um, to local groups by the GLC between 1981 and 1986 went towards the purchase, rent, or upkeep of material property. The Hillside Nursery, for example, um, of the money it received, uh, 7,500 pounds of that was simply to rent a new property. Uh, one solution posed, or proposed, I should say, to the problem of racial harassment on the Lincoln Estate was to buy property to establish a women's center, not only uh, as a means of a physical space where Bangladeshi women could feel safe, but also as a means of fostering a multiracial community through the use of a common space, as had apparently happened on other estates in Poplar, for instance. So local groups and the GLC thus created new spaces in 1980s London. Centers for women, centers for children, gay and lesbian people, pensioners, the unemployed, ethnic minorities, youth. Acquiring material space in this way afforded these groups what has been called politics of recognition, giving them both visibility and safety. A dynamic that was central, for example, in the social and political history of, of gay and lesbian people after 1967, as Lucy Robinson and, and Matt Cook have pointed out, and what was absent from pre-1967 queer life, as, as Matt Holbrook's work has shown. This is also an example of how London witnessed in the 80s what Michael Keith and Steve Pyle called the spatialized politics of identity. The politics of space in 1980s London, I think, had particularly sharp edges because GLC-funded centers competed with an emerging neoliberal landscape, as work by Sam Weatherall and Anna Minton have shown. Uh, look, if you look at things like the redevelopment of the city of London, the establishment of urban development corporations, or the promotion of the private housing market. So space is a point of contestation in London, and it's a point of ideological contestation. I'm also interested in bringing emotion to bear upon thinking about cultures of democracy. And there is, of course, much discussion, there was a really fascinating panel yesterday, across a variety of literatures about emotion and the links between emotion and politics. I've been fairly a uh, small c Catholic in my approach in this paper to what counts as an emotion, including the usual suspects, love, anger, and fear, but also following research on emotions in various fields, also including empathy, compassion, and hope. I'm interested in the, the work that such emotions do politically, whether it's in what Barbara Rosenwein uh, has called emotional communities, built out of systems of feeling, modes of emotional expression, and effective bonds, or the formation of emotional regimes and refuges, as William Reddy has charted, um, or Uchi Freyberg's argument for a dynamic and mobile uh, historical economy of emotions. Emotion linked uh, what might seem like disparate things, the stories I've told, the funding of the child care center in 82, and the experience of racial harassment in 84. In the example of child care, we, we might first think of, of love, of parental love, or the, the love for children. But I think we should also think of empathy for the burden of women involved with child care. In the example of the Lincoln estate, the emotions are, are more stark, fear and hatred. 
In both cases, I will argue, emotion was crucial to political agency and democratic culture, both in terms of experience and in terms of language. And in this, I'm, of course, indebted to important work in British uh, history on emotions by, by Claire Langhammer, Tara Cook, and Martin Francis, and to recent scholarship on socialist ideology, soci uh, sociology, and psychology by Jeremy Nuttall and Lisa Butler. And I, I don't want to go all uh, transnational hardcore, but um, <laughs> research in different geographic fields by, for example, David Austin on Poland, Matrina Citrine on Argentina, uh, Nicole Eustis on colonial British uh, North America has also uh, influenced how, how I think about this, and it's really amazing stuff on, on how emotions, space, and politics uh, work together. The feminist theorist uh, Sarah Ahmed has spoken of affective economies in which, as she writes, emotions do things. They align individuals with communities through the very intensity of their attachments. Ahmed explores how emotions circulate, how they work as what she calls social and cultural practices, and how they accumulate in each aspect affecting the social world. As Ahmed and, and other authors argue, and it's, it's kind of a premise of my paper too, that emotions also do those things in physical space. In other words, they, it operates and affects physical space. It's this movement between emotions, space, and politics that I'm interested in and that I'm exploring provisionally in this paper, whether following Ahmed, it's termed affective economy, or by others, um, affective environment. The, the term that I prefer, and it's been used in some literature on Italy, the, the, the term that I prefer because it suggests a kind of dynamic interaction between diverse elements. Um, <laughs> They're calling to find out what this term is. <laughs> it's effective ecology. <laughs> no, it's worth the wait. Okay, effective ecology. So in 1980s London, I will argue, ex experience, emotion, and space formed an effective ecology that helped shape and was shaped by a particular culture of democracy. The touchstone of this effective ecology for me, or what I'm thinking about, was everyday life. A few years ago now, um, Matthew Hilton wrote of seeing, and I quote, in the everyday, a whole host of interactions from which politics emerges. Politics are often hidden, as Alice Kaplan and Kristen Ross have similarly written, uh, and I quote, in the everyday, exactly where it is most obvious. Such everyday politics become, I think, more visible when everyday life itself becomes confrontational, or what Ben Heimler has uh, said, becomes interrupted and dysfunctional. Confrontation, interruption, and dysfunction can be seen, for example, in reflecting the commonplace interactions of the stories that I've told in Wandsworth, going to work, seeking work, looking after children, or on the Lincoln estate, simply dwelling, or going beyond one's door, playing in the street, shopping, all of those things become infused with the sense of confrontation. I was, I was thinking about uh, what Jeff Ely was talking about last night, about um, that sense of confrontation fueling democracy. I think I'm, I'm sort of talking about perhaps less or more quotidian examples of this in, in the everyday. So those quotidian interactions become struggles and confrontations, the source of dysfunction. And not least, they become laden with emotion, movingly expressed, for example, in a quote from one of the stories I've told, and I'll quote it again. The women do not dare to go out. This, I think, is the voice of what Raymond Williams called, and I quote, meanings and values as they are actively lived and felt. It's the language of a structure of feeling. If we take one everyday experience, childcare, and think about what happens in Wandsworth in 1982 and Tower Hamlets in 1984, we might see just how much is at stake. Having your children looked after in Wandsworth so that you can work, or feeling safe enough in Tower Hamlets to allow your children to play outside, there is, I will argue, an effective ecology that surrounds such moments, 
a diverse and complex dynamic among individuals, communities, and the state to address those profound material and emotional concerns, and thus a politics. This effective ecology also demonstrates something that I'm, I'm not going to be talking about very much, but I do think it's very important. But I, I just, in terms of time, I, I didn't think I could talk about it. But it demonstrates the efficacy of social movements working at the municipal level in the 1980s, particularly women's liberation and gay liberation. And in this way, and again, I think I'm, I'm probably echoing something Jeff was suggesting um, last night, in this way, making the personal, political, involve foregrounding and emotion, foregrounding emotions and finding material space in the city. What I do want to talk about um, is the role of the state in all of this, because the state helped shape and was itself shaped by this effective ecology. In the 1980s, the GLC explicitly concerned itself with the politics of everyday life. There's a lovely quote from an unlikely poetic source a memorandum on the London Industrial Strategy, in which the GLC admitted it could not, and I quote, deliver utopias by de decree in one city, but that it could, in areas such as transport, work, and culture, and I quote again, enable aspirations for a better way to take shape, to grow in strength, and to find a life of their own. The authors of the memo evoked that vision by talking about a women's cooperative guild tea towel, an object compelling to them because you could hold, as they said, you could hold the utopian vision every time you did the washing up. <laughs> and the GLC's hopes in this regard were, were those kind of absolutely rooted, I think, in the everyday, but they also had an explicitly emotional context. And, and again, this is from, from that same memo. What did they want to do? They wanted to, and I quote, enable people to enjoy pleasant relations and connections in the course of doing everyday tasks, encouraging association, trust, pleasure, and mutual aid." Unquote. Towards this end, the, the GLC used grants to support what it called self-help initiatives by local groups. Between 1981 and 1986, the funds available for this were considerable. When it was established in 1982, for example, the Women's Committee had a staff of four and a budget of 300000 by the time of the GLC's abolition in 86, the Women's Committee staff numbered about 100, and its annual budget was 16 million pounds. Of course, spending on grants had occurred well before the Labour GLC. But what was different was the scale of expenditure. And this was helped by tax revenue left over by a failed attempt to subsidize transport fares, the fares fare policy, which was lost in the courts. In this way, and I'm adapting an argument of David Harvey, there's a particular kind of urban development in London between 81 and 86, which is built on a social democratic, not capitalist surplus, a social democratic surplus. The important work by Daisy Paling on Sheffield affords another example of such initiatives at the local level. What I think was also different between 81 and 86 in London was the intent. The commitment to large-scale spending put the GLC on a collision course with a conservative government, of course, and it led to abolition in 86. The media generated an image of a radical, excessive, left in power at the local level, doling out money to organizations such as Babies Against the Bomb, the English Collective of Prostitutes, and so on. This picture, unsurprisingly, was an entirely false one. Most of the grant money distributed by the Women's Committee, as I've already said, for example, went to that most radical event, <coughs> childcare. Or, on reflection, perhaps state-funded childcare is radical. So, maybe they got that right. Another charge against the grants process was that it was chaotic, slipshod in its execution, and that it was simply driven by a desire to, in the words of one critical observer, get the money out of the building. However, the GLC grants process might also be seen in a different way, as an attempt to redefine the relationship between state and citizen. In the 70s and 80s, Stuart Hall and Sheila Robottom had critiqued the corporatist or interventionist state, or they critiqued a welfare state that had, as uh, Robottom said, the power to declare what is someone's welfare. The grants program of the GLC was a different beast altogether using state money to animate local groups. 
The purpose of power, Knight Bevan once remarked, is to be able to give it away. If this is so, the GLC gave away a lot of power. Getting the money out of the building was also getting power out of County Hall, a devolution of the state. It was a means by which the GLC consciously hoped to deliver, and I quote, more responsible forms of state care, more responsive forms of state care, and to explore, and I quote again, a more democratic approach to planning. To me, this recalls Stuart Hall's hopeful vision of 1988, of what he called public intervention, enabling a pluralistic social democracy driven by, and I quote, different tastes, purposes, destinations, desires. The 100 flowers that the GLC helped plant through the grants process were also undoubtedly intended as a defiant bloom to set against neoliberalism. The 1980 Local Government Planning and Land Act and the 1981 London Docklands Development um, Corporation encouraged the building of spectacular temples of neoliberalism, such as Broadgate and Canary Wharf. Resistance to this came at the local level with organizations like the New and Docklands Forum, which managed to establish some humble counterparts to uh, counterweights to these capitalist leviathans in the form of a plan center, a laundrette, a training center, and a crush. It's not too fanciful to suggest that the GLC grants process similar helped construct an alternative uh, political landscape across London whose unspectacular monuments included women's centers and nurseries. To again quote David Harvey, a right to the city involved placing particular kinds of social processes and relationships into spatial form. And in this way, I think local social democracy was made material by the GLC. Thinking about what happens in London in the 80s might, might also help us think a little bit differently about democratic participation in the post-war period, both in terms of the state and the citizen. <coughs> in his wonderful book, Lost Freedom, uh, Matthew Thompson suggests that we might, and I quote, extend our view of the post-war settlement beyond the traditional territory of social and economic policy to include powerful structures of feeling. Thinking particularly, uh, according to Thompson, of the agency of ordinary people in a fault line between state and citizen. And following this, I'm interested in powerful structures of feeling that envelop the two different stories that I've told about, about childcare and racism. And the way that these effective ecologies might illuminate the relationship between citizen and state. Now, in the time that I have left, I want to explore this in a, in a brief but detailed fashion through a discussion of emotion, space, and politics in terms of child care and racial harassment. And I should say that the way that I'm getting at this methodologically is by looking at grant applications to the GLC. Um, it's an amazing archive, and um, that process required local groups seeking funding to describe themselves, to describe their objectives, their achievements, to, to describe the community they spoke for in very different communities. Um, working class communities, generationally different communities, very different communities. And they also have to, of course, say what were the ends to which the funds would be used. And we have the responses of the granting bodies as well. So it's, it's a wonderful prism, I think, to thinking about what's going on the ground, what's happening on the ground in London. The other context I wish to emphasize, because I do think it framed particular issues, is the highly charged, effective, or emotional atmosphere of 1980s London. Um, and I sort of lived in London in the 80s, but this is not nostalgic for my emotional ups and downs, which is <laughs> about the politics of that period. In the 60s and 70s, um, protests and social movements adopted a more emotionally intense language than other political actors, more obviously infused, for example, uh, with anger. Thatcherite neoliberalism was similarly launched on a tide of anger and confrontation, often playing upon fear, as research on inflation, the winter of discontent, and race has suggested. Anna Marie Smith has argued, for example, that fear and animosity guided the right's approach to sexuality and race, trained in particular on the target of local government. And we can see this fear and animosity expressed at the level of high and popular politics. Norman Tebbett railed against many things, but he railed against, for example, sexual deviation. Thatcher spoke, and I quote, of hard left education authorities and extremist teachers telling children that they had an inalienable, inalienable right to be gay, which, as it turns out, they do have that right. 
in, in Harry Day, groups campaigning against local uh, education authorities played upon parental fear. One such pamphlet read, for example, and I quote, My name is Betty Sheridan. I live in, I live in Harringay. I'm married with two children, and I'm scared. If you vote Labour, they'll go on teaching my kids about gays and lesbians instead of giving them proper lessons. The political center and the old left were not immune to such emotional discourses. In particular, I think the 83 Bermondsey by-election show. But I guess the larger point is that this was not a politics of emotional restraint or of emotional management. It was, instead, an attempt to use emotion to, in the words of uh, Pierre Bordeaux, uh, to articulate the principles of vision and division. Adopting William Reddy's analysis, this constituted, I think, an emotional regime built uh, upon a discourse, what he would call an emotive, that was laced with animus and fear. As the 1984 Police and Criminal Evidence Act Section 28, the 1988 Education Act all showed these emotives and this emotional regime had sharp material consequences for everyday life. The left in the form of the GLC responded with its own emotives that posited a different emotional regime. Its ideological critique of monetarism was expressed in emotional language of anger and outrage. The Thatcher government was described in one memo on monetarism, for instance. Uh, the Thatcher government was identified with what was called the destruction of existing jobs and life, the scandal of unemployment that had resulted in, and I quote, a roll call of the dead in the city. Thatcher was compared to Pinochet as someone who was deliberately promoting social war, and I quote, the financier against the industrials, the employer against labor, and the rich against the poor. The GLC's alternative politics was similarly infused with language that expressed a different emotional regime, in this case, compassion and empathy, to, to rival the other emotions. In the document on the London Industrial Strategy, uh, for instance, the GLC insisted, and I quote, the principle of social responsibility for human beings beyond our immediate family and neighbors is a fundamental basis for cooperative rather than competitive way of life. That kind of expression, of course, evokes an older tradition of ethical and utopian socialism, but it was also something that was to counter neoliberalism. It was, it was a weapon against neoliberalism. As I've said, the struggle between different emotions and different expressions of emotion has a spatial aspect. For the right, the struggle was about the control of schools, housing, and economic space like the Docklands. For the GLC, it was about establishing a landscape that reflected its political and emotional agenda. One GLC document, for example, mapped an imaginary city as, and I quote, a network of women's centers. In a way, centers like this were, were, were what Reddy has called emotional refuges, material and discursive spaces against neoliberalism that promoted or indeed protected groups or people from a hostile emotional regime. And so in this light, child care centers, women's centers, centers dedicated to ethnic minorities, or gay and lesbian people, were like the salons of 18th century France, of which Reddy speaks. They were not just figurative refuges, of course, thinking about things like centers for victims of sexual violence, nor should we underplay material violence at this time. There were, for example, arson attacks on a women's center near King's Cross, and on the offices of the Ethnic Minorities Unit. And of course, there was ongoing homophobic and racist violence. In the final section of the paper, I, I want to see how this larger effective ecology appeared in issues such as child care and racial harassment. And I'll, I'll start with child care. The, the starting point for thinking about child care um, um, is not actually the child. Um, sort of said. It's not actually a child, but in the, in the 80s, it's the mother, and it's the position of women. Redressing the inequality of women was perceived by the GLC as a priority, that is, it perceived racism and homophobia. And child care was seen as absolutely central to that aim. The GLC's description of gender disadvantage was rendered, consistently rendered, in emotional tones, colored by outrage or empathy for women's situation. Using language such as, and I quote, women are poor, women are abused, women are isolated, 
Addressing this problem required policies such as employment equity, but it also required bu building a physically and socially different London. Funding women's centers, and in particular funding child care centers, would pr provide material and emotional refuges for women, where communities might be formed out of shared experiences and emotions, as this quote from the GLC's Program of Action for Women of ADP shows, and it's, it's a longish quote. Women need somewhere in their own neighborhood from which to run campaigns for more nursery places, better housing, where women can drop in for support, courage, advice, contacts. Women need childcare, they need work. Women are abused, they need somewhere sympathetic and close at hand to get help, advice, collective strength. Women are isolated. Women's centers can help draw women into the community. They can put women in like situations in touch with each other. In this way, as Thomas Buchanan has written recently, emotions are basic to claims for enhanced rights, resonances of which we can, of course, see over the last few centuries. If we move from the voice of the GLC to the voice of local groups seeking funding for childcare, we can see the same patterns of emotional expression. In December 1982, for example, the Dalston Children's Center applied for a grant to expand its facilities. In its application, the center stated that it was committed to the needs of children, but also, and I quote, the needs of those who are responsible for children, mostly women, end quote. A larger property could accommodate the emotional needs of women by setting aside, and I quote, space where the women can meet, read, talk, share their experiences. Most of our users need the space away from their children. They could spend <coughs> an hour or so on their own. Similarly, an Anglican-run uh, child care center uh, project in Penjan Annerley sought funds to expand a meeting place for parents as well as play facilities for their children. This was particularly helpful in emotional as much as material terms, and I quote, this will encourage parents to believe in their own ability and in their own worth thereby strengthening their determination to make Penn generally a better place to live in. Thus hope, empathy, and God forgive me for using this word, aspiration. <laughs> As one can sense from this quote, what was also happening through such discourse was the building of what Rosenwein would call an emotional community, constructed out of shared sentiments and emotional expression. An outreach project for women and children on the Peeps Estate in Deptford, for example, wanted to fund a variety of activities in a community flat, including a crash and a single parent support group. It was also hoped that this space would be helpful to teenage girls, and I quote, as they have not use of any physical space that's not overrun by boys. This was placed in the context both of helping, quote, the larger number of women imprisoned on the estate during the day and building a community. And I quote, we're trying to create a community spirit on the estate, to make community more self-aware and more self-articulate, to raise consciousness on the estate around questions like provision for under fives, problems of unemployed women, lack of community resources. Childcare in the 80s was, of course, at the heart of everyday life for many women. It was, and it is, an everyday experience of great material and emotional ambiguity as Denise Riley wrote in 1987, both a pleasure and a bitterly exhausting fight. It is also, echoing Ben Highmore, a moment of everyday life that can become quickly dysfunctional, not least in the context of social and economic deprivation. And it's in that moment an everyday politics might appear. And this politics in 1980s London was accompanied by emotional expression, formation of emotional communities, a focus upon physical space and building an alternative city, enabled by a combination of local agency and the state. In short, I think childcare demonstrated an effective ecology. In 1979, Sheila Roadbottom caught this rich interaction around childcare. I mean, uh, Sheila Roadbottom was, was always first in writing about these things, and it's, it's always amazing to read her. And you sort of think you come to an original thought, and then you read her and say, oh, God, she said that in 70 years. <laughs> <laughs> um, so in 1979, Sheila Robotham caught this rich interaction around childcare, saying, and I quote, in demanding childcare, we're not only asking for a thing or for money, we're contesting for the use, control, and distribution of social resources. 
This involves a concept of how we want to work, how we want to care for children, but also to play and indeed to love. And in the present economic crisis, with the Tories on the offensive, this is going to be a very desperate struggle. Um, I'm coming to the end, but I want to uh, talk about racial harassment, and some of the same themes can be seen. In 1984, a number of investigations carried out by the Ethnic Minorities Committee and the Housing Committee highlighted the problem of racial intimidation and violence on estates in East London, of which the Lincoln exam uh, estate was a, an example. So-called reception committees on estates would intimidate prospective Asian tenants with verbal abuse and threats. In one case on the Montmorey's estate, and I quote, the estate officer and prospective Bangladeshi tenants were met by what can, cannot be termed as anything other than a mob shedding abuse. When the family were actually viewing the inside, uh, the people outside chanted such things as pigs, curry eaters, and black bastards, unquote. Bangladeshi families on other estates were regularly subjected to what was termed by uh, the ethnic minorities community, and I quote, unalloyed racial hatred. The victims of this racial harassment conveyed their experience to various GLC bodies in emotional terms, with fear and with despair, and I quote. The women were afraid to go to any public building. Racial harassment is placing these women in a position of extreme isolation. Children cannot safely be allowed out to play. Parents describe the agony of seeing their children attacked and abused and being unable to protect them, unquote. Such fear and despair formed communities. On the one hand, it underscored the collective identity of migrants brought together by their emotional and material experience. And that reached into ordinary life, if we think of the, the account of the men going shopping as a group and coming back in a taxi in order to protect themselves. So that everyday experience becomes extraordinarily confrontational, dysfunctional, and, and complex. It also led to political agency, and I don't have as much time to talk about this, but the, the archive of the GLC is you know, full of the formation of local organizations intended to promote and protect a wide range of ethnic groups in areas such as housing, uh, but also in areas such as culture. The GLC also um, played a role. Its response to the problem of racial harassment was to invest in networks of local communities, so for centers for ethnic minorities and other initiatives designed to address racism and its effects, whether this included media projects, employment initiatives, race and housing action teams, or on a citywide scale, committing resources to anti-racist programs. Uh, thinking of Gavin Schaefer's recent important work on race and television, one of, one of the targets was also supporting the participation of ethnic minorities in the media. I'm not going to, I think I'm going to cut down talking about this, but one really important um, focus was the response of the police to racial harassment. The Scarman Report of 81, of course, had already pointed to deep problems with uh, the police and community relations. And the stories of harassment on East London estates <laughs> illustrated this problem painfully. In general, the police dismissed accounts, or incidents, excuse me, of racial harassment as, I quote, kids pranks. In one case of a threatened bomb attack, a senior police officer, and I quote, laughed the matter off. And of course, this simply deepened the problem. It was the cause of deep frustration and humiliation for the victims of racial harassment. It meant that the only solution left to them was either to request a transfer to another state or to pursue a private prosecution, which of course is very difficult and very expensive. Yeah, I, I think I'm gonna um, sort of, uh, hold this down a bit, but one point I wanted to make, that this happens against a larger context of as people like Stuart Hall and Anne-Marie Smith have written about, that the Thatcher government was very much complicit in constructing an emotional regime that was antagonistic to ethnic minorities, whether we look at cess laws of, you know, on the ground, or we look at larger things like the Thatcher government's approach to South Africa at this time. So there was a way that the GLC and local groups were, were working against that larger regime. But, but I want to finish off talking about racial harassment and finish off the paper, but one of the things I do think we need to think about is the perpetrators of racial harassment, whose actions were also colored by emotion. 
whose actions were also concerned with space. Those studying the history of emotions and the relationship between emotion and politics have noted the role of anger in politics, particularly in terms of how, as David Austin suggested, this can produce what he calls exclusive solidarities. For the white community of the Lincoln estate, for example, the primary emotion was fear at the encroachment of what was perceived to be their space by racial others. Another emotion was anger at those racial others expressed in harassment and violence, but also at the GLC itself for apparently allowing um, racial others to intrude upon their space. Emotion was, of course, inevitably involved in a struggle of, again, what Bordeaux is called habitus, but he calls the sense of one's place and the sense of the place of others. So the, the effect of ecology around racial harassment is, is very, com very complex and very powerful on both sides. Its emotional purchase began with the breakdown of everyday experiences, things just like dwelling, shopping, playing, and everyday spaces like corridors, flats, streets. It involved the agency of both ordinary people on, on either side and the state, and it did lead to particular kinds of politics and democratic participation. So I want to conclude. In this paper, I've tried to think about the diverse patterns and values involved in the cultures of democracy in 1980s London. And I've suggested that thinking about space, emotion, and the everyday might deepen our understanding of this question. Um, I began uh, the paper with two stories, and I, I want to end it with one photograph by Mike Seaborn of a mother and toddlers group in a community center on the Isle of Dogs in, in 1986. And the reason I want to conclude with this, photo, uh, conclude with this photograph is to think about how the portrait of everyday life that it presents, um, mothers and children in a shared communal space, might also offer a portrait of an unspectacular but complex and moving culture of democracy. If unspectacular, the horizons of this politics or this culture of democracy were nonetheless, I think, profound in their emotional and material importance. To have a place, to have agency within a community, to have work and to have children, to live free from violence and threat. And after all, what is so funny about peace, love, and understanding? Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Um, and I want to start by saying just what a lovely paper I thought that was, um, just full of ideas that we can pull out, think with, as well as think about. Um, it did a great job of identifying the ways in which space, emotion, politics and the everyday played out in 1980s London. Implicit within it were new ways of framing what was at stake emotionally and materially in the shifting patterns of democratic participation that followed the Second World War. It does, I think, demonstrate the richness of current work on what we might call hardcore contemporary history. A field that the Birmingham Working Paper number one sees as particularly fragmented, but which I would characterise much more positively as an area within which people are doing somewhat messy, complex, theoretically informed, and methodologically exciting research. Indeed, this seems to be what the interdisciplinarity which permeates Stephen's paper demands, a plurality of approaches that won't necessarily generate an overarching interpretative framework through which to understand the transformation of modern Britain, but out of which might emerge a plurality of narratives that we might just want to play with. Fields that are dominant arts are sometimes just a little bit dull. Text that everyone has to read can set things in stone that might better be opened up. The pursuit of the big question can have unfortunate consequences for cultures of democracy within the discipline itself and can make invisible the kind of everyday experiences that Stephen has been talking about. <coughs> 
Now, I'm not going to talk about the body either, <laughs> and I'm not going to dwell on the utopian potential of the tea towel, although frankly I do have a lot to say about that. <laughs> <laughs> but I am going to say something about the two other pivots around which you crafted your lecture, space and emotion. In fact, I want to think even more about what happens when we put the two together alongside experience and politics. To think about what a focus on materiality, actual material space, and what happens in it can do for the way we think about emotion as historians. So in this paper, Stephen moves, moves, I think quite beautifully, across a range of different approaches that have emerged from scholars of emotion. Particularly striking is his use of the notion of effective ecology, which does, I think, really, really nicely describe the complexity of the relationships he's trying to outline here. I wonder whether the notion of spatially defined emotional styles might add an additional dimension, not least in relation to perpetrators of racial violence. Then O'Gamel's suggestion that distinct spatial settings demand distinct emotional repertoires might help us to think a little bit more about the uses and significance of emotion within everyday life and politics as people move from place to place, space to space. My second and related point concerns the ways in which emotion is deployed as a political tool. In this paper, Stephen has demonstrated the ways in which particular emotional regimes were promoted, employed, used by left and right within the 1980s as the political discourse oscillated between fear and anger. In contrast, he shows the GLC's attempts to build a politics of hope and what we might think of as an everyday kindness framed around ostensibly small-scale interventions in actual lives. However, we might also think a little more about emotional politics from the bottom up. To think about the ways that the intimate categories of experience and emotion were deployed as ways of knowing the world and as grounds for participating in a dynamic public sphere. Within this context, the status of authentic feeling above and beyond attitude or even belief, provides a democratising and increasingly embodied response to social worlds and everyday politics. Within contemporary society, the power of authentic feeling to support authoritative knowledge, knowledge claims and, as Stephen suggested, demand rights and cohere collective organisation and indeed to facilitate resistance is increasingly apparent. Thinking about the development of this distinctive form of democratic politics within which the binary opposition between feeling and rationality, the long established basis for gendered, class, and race constructions of citizenship, has unravelled is something that is probably worth doing. Finally, something about emotional labour. Um, in the paper, Stephen refers to the emotional labour of childcare. I wonder whether we might also think about the emotional labour of politics. The ways in which feeling is not just a response to political circumstance, nor just a driver for action, but is an important aspect of the work of a particular kind of local politics. Be it the work of responding to grant applications for the GLC, or working with victims of racial harassment. In this way, we might think about the emotional burdens placed upon those workers charged with dealing with the emotional politics in particular spaces. And I think this would add an economic dimension, uh, the exchange value of emotion to a picture that is already complex, complicated and clever. Thank you.